Hello and welcome to our workshop, Working with Schools, which we should have been presenting at the end of this month. Obviously due to certain things uh, we haven't been able to, so I thought I'd try and do something that might be a bit similar or the next best thing that we can do under the circumstances and uh, share the presentation with you. Obviously, if you've got any questions, then please do give us a ring at the on the phone number at the end, or please email me on julie.pocklington at leeds.gov.uk. So when you are working with schools, it's important to understand that every school now has to have something called a designated teacher for looked after and previously looked after children, otherwise just known as a designated teacher. Um, although they have to have a, a, te a designated teacher, they do not necessarily have to have a governor. And it's important to remember that they've only had responsibility for previously looked after children since September 2018. Um, so it's quite a relatively new responsibility and historically their role only included children who were currently in the care system. So they may not have experienced an adopted child before and may not have had any experience of working with adopted children and the parents or have a great understanding of the complexities that we all experience and what they're working with. Um, try and see the designated teacher as the first point of contact. Um, unless you know another member of staff has a really good relationship with your child or somebody that you feel that you can trust. The expectation is, however, that they should still be reporting to the designated teacher. So there's a picture here of the, the guidance that describes the role of the designated teacher. And if you go online and, and Google that, Make sure you put February 2018 in because that's when the guidance came out. Otherwise, you'll end up with loads of other stuff that have probably got very little to do with what, what we're talking about now. So there's a link there in the presentation that will hopefully work. It's important to remember that the designated teacher will only know that your child is previously looked after if you tell them. If your child has recently moved to high school, do not presume that the primary school will pass on this information. The new guidance was written in February 2018, but the expectation was that that didn't get put into practice until September 2018. And that's when the designated teacher's responsibilities grew to include previously looked after children. So it's their role to be the point of initial contact within the school about anything to do with looked after children and previously looked after children. And also to ensure that the school plays its role in fulfilling and making arrangements for these children so they minimise any disruption to a child's learning. They should have a high expectation of looked after and previously looked after children's learning and set targets to accelerate their educational progress. And that's recognising that a lot of children will have experienced a lot of emotional, psychological and social effects of loss and separation from their birth families and that some children may find it difficult to build up new relationships of trust with adults because of these experiences. And so it's really important that they are very attachment aware. Um, and perhaps when you go around and look at schools, that might be some of the questions to ask about when they had their last training, who are the right people that have this um, understanding of your child and have this understanding of how their, their, their pre-birth and early years experiences may affect their behaviours in school. It's also important for the designated teacher to see looked after and previously looked after children um, as individuals rather than one big group and in public not treat them any differently to their peers. Privately perhaps show a lot of sensitivity and be aware that not everybody needs to know that they are previously looked after or adopted. Um, I think when we've listened to our adopted teenagers quite often they're amazed at how many people know that they're adopted even though they haven't told anybody or just told one person uh, and that even goes as far as uh, pupils knowing that they're adopted sometimes when they haven't chosen to tell them. 
So for previously looked after children, it's important that the designated teacher understands the importance of involving the child's parents or guardians in those decisions affecting their child's education. And as we've said earlier, be the contact for, for the parents if they've got advice or if they, sorry, if they, they need advice or if they've got any concerns about their child's progress at school. It's also the role to ensure that school policies and procedures do not um, unintentionally put an adopted child at a disadvantage. They should also be thinking about good transition pass packages and also think about how to use the Pupil Premium Plus to, to sort of promote children's education and identify gaps in learning. And they also need to promote a positive culture so that children can learn, develop and succeed. It's important as well that they can offer advice to teachers regarding strategies to support looked after and previously looked after children and help them set short, medium and long term goals. So if you choose to let school know that your child is adopted um, and um, they have been in the care system then the school can claim something called Pupil Premium Plus funding. And this is an acknowledgement uh, from the government that a child who has been in the care system will have gaps in their learning and also might find learning a bit more difficult. If the school doesn't know that your child is previously looked after, then they cannot claim the funding. So the funding is claimed in something called the school's January census and is paid directly to the school and it's just gone up to £2,345 uh, per child. So, so that's every year that your child is in school. Um, if you choose to let the school know that they're previously looked after, they can claim that amount of funding annually. And since the guidance came out in 2018, it says that that funding should be used for those children attracting it. So it's not a personal budget for every child and schools are not accountable for every single penny of how they're spending that on your child. But it is an acknowledgement that that group of children may have gaps in their learning and additional things may need to be put in place to support that. It also says that it's good practice to discuss the use of the Pupil Premium Plus with parents. I think the other thing for me is it's really important to distinguish between the pupil premium funding, uh, the pupil premium plus funding for looked after children and the pupil premium plus funding for previously looked after children, which doesn't make things easy for anybody to understand. So it's just a bit unfortunate that they've given them all very similar names. Pupil premium money is for those children on free school meals and that's usually displayed on the website as to how that funding is used. It's paid directly to the, to the school to decide how to use that. Pupil Premium Plus for looked after children, it goes to something called the virtual school and they then pass that money on to the schools. And the Pupil Premium Plus for previously looked after children is paid directly to the school. And as the guidance states, the good practice is to discuss the use of the funding with the parents. So when you're thinking about choosing a school for your child, um, the government have made things easier, although sometimes I think it might be harder, um, as there isn't really a catchment area for a previously looked after child. Um, you can pick any school that you think you want your child to go to or that can best meet your child's needs that is a mainstream school. So although you know you might think your local primary school is the best school for your child that's fine but if you think that, that the school three miles away may better suit your child then you can actually put that one down. It's really important that you uh, tick the box when you're applying for schools that your child is previously looked after and in some cases you may be asked to prove that, so they might want to see the adoption certificate. Um, other, other places may just accept that. Um, but it is flagged up and you will get your first, if you flag that up on the application form, then you will get your first choice of mainstream school. If your child happens to have an education 
and health and care plan or an EHCP, um, then that's um, sort of a bit of a top trump really. So um, if your child does have an EHCP, then you can pick a school and a school has to say whether it can meet need or not. And at that point, the EHCP is a top trump, if you like. Um, so it doesn't matter that your child was previously looked after. If schools say they cannot meet their needs, then we have to go with that and then you'll need to think of a different school. Or you can't say if, if, if a specialist provision perhaps has got um, or is, is oversubscribed, then you're not be able, going to be able to say that um, my child's a previously looked after child and therefore should, ha should have priority over everybody else because the EHCP determines need and that's the priority that that's given. Also, when you're thinking about a school, go and visit, talk to people and go visit again. Um, it's important that you, you sort of feel that you can go there as many times as you need to to suss things out. Um, if a school can't make time for you when you're going to choose a school, you know, they're busy or they haven't got capacity, then that's pretty much an, an indication of how much time they'll allow for you if you choose to send your child to that school. So I, I think that's a bit of a, a helpful marker, really, when you're thinking about schools. When we're thinking about transition um, or change, we know that any change is tough, especially given the time that children will now have spent at home. Um, getting up and going to school has not been a feature of their lives. They've been very used to spending all the time at home and with parents, which in a way I think is um, quite nice and probably what a lot of our children need. But perhaps for others it's been really tough. So when we think about transition, we think about moving, not just from school to school, but year to year, or lesson to lesson, or teacher to teacher. And I guess what we think about is how we can support that. And any pre-knowledge is helpful, or can be. Um, we know that some of our children really struggle. Um, if they're told weeks in advance what will be happening, they can't manage that. And it's important to remember that you know your child best. And you are, in fact, the expert in your child. So let's think about what can help. Preparation for some children is key, as we've said. So is it possible to walk past the school? If, if it is, then talk about school. Talk about the positive, th the positive things that have happened there. Talk about things that have been funny there. Have a look at the cars. See whose teachers are in or who's, who's not in. Um, wonder what they're doing. Perhaps you can see those teachers working with key workers, children. Perhaps give them a wave as you go past. Or try and arrange a wave as you go past just so that they can get to have a look and have that understanding that actually school is still open for some children and that those teachers and those children haven't gone away. For those who are moving school, um, perhaps think about using um, the internet. School websites are really good. They often, especially in primary schools, will have pictures of the teachers and which classes they're responsible for on the website. So perhaps re-familiarise yourself with those. Also getting up the school prospectus, having a look about what the day is going to be like, what time they will be expected to do things, who's responsible for what, might help help um, just get your children's head around what's going to happen in the future. Perhaps Google walk the journey. So if you've got a school that you can't walk to when you're on your hours walk each day, perhaps Google. Get the Google Maps up, have a look at that, go down the roads, look at familiar things, notice when they've passed shops, um, perhaps if they're going to use the bus for the first time, perhaps sort of spend more time looking at the end of the journey, so things that they can look out for and become familiar with. Um, perhaps when you see that corner shop, then you start to press the bell to get off. Um, all those different things that you can perhaps think of. So also think about 
whether at a Skype meeting or a WhatsApp meeting with people that are important to your child at school could be taking place. I know that schools have got different ways of managing that. Um, and I guess it just depends on the school and what sort of um, situation staff are in and what they're dealing with themselves at home. But maybe they could send cards or you could write a letter um, as part of your school day um, to key people and see if they can respond. Um, perhaps it might be better to know that they can definitely respond to, to letters rather than um, setting children up to write letters and expect a response and not get one back. So, and when you're thinking about the staff that are at the school, are they attachment and trauma informed? Do they know what that means for your child and how best to manage things? And if you've got any strategies that you use or that you've learnt that perhaps could be helpful to pass on to those staff, quite often using similar language um, can be useful. Um, ways that you try and calm and regulate your child might be really helpful. Knowing how long your child takes to calm down or that they might need to check in with important people can be really helpful and sharing that information uh, can just smooth things over for your child. Good communication is essential and it's important to remember that everybody wants the best for your child. You know, you don't go into the teaching profession thinking I'm going to hate every child. Um, you go into the teaching profession to think that you can offer something and so they want your child to succeed as much as you do. So think about um, how often and what form of communication you want with school and negotiate that with them beforehand um, and that way there's no unrealistic expectations. Trying to catch a teacher first thing in the morning is, is really, really tricky. They're trying to get all the children in and settled. And obviously they've done a lot of preparation for their lessons. So sometimes that's not a good time to chat. Um, and obviously you don't want to be talking about sensitive things in front of your child and everybody else. So arranging a quiet time when you can have those conversations uh, can, can be really important as well. And that way as well, there's no unrealistic unrealistic expectations on anybody and nobody gets disappointed. Having a good relationship with school is key um, and I think every adoptive parent will say that. Um, it's how you manage that I guess. So try and keep things positive and use your pre-negotiated communication plan there might be a member of staff who you realise gets your child more than the, chi the, um, the, the person that you talk to. So see if you can get them on board. Also think whether it might be helpful to have a plan that could be reviewed on a termly basis. And when you're thinking about your child, um, maybe a bit of pre-learning could be helpful. So knowing what's coming up, certain issues can impact on children. It's emotional state, depending on where they are and what they're feeling. So knowing about that beforehand can be really helpful. You might have a child that forgets things. They've learnt things one day and forget it the next. But, you know, I don't know if they're doing telling the time the next day, then perhaps you could just whiz over that during the evening. And um, that will give them the confidence that they'll be able to manage in the, the, the following day. So any preparation can be really helpful um, around things that might be different. So... We know that some children will struggle with things that we think are quite exciting and quite nice. So perhaps going on a school trip or having a school party or having a visitor into school. These are things that we all see as really positive, but that can be really, really frightening for our children and they will respond accordingly. So any preparation that school can, can offer you or any information beforehand is, is really helpful. Visual things might be really helpful, um, now and next, or um, having a timer on the desk so that they know that in five minutes time there's going to be something different. Um, schools will have a lot of experience about that. You might want to think about something called a transitional object. So it might be at home that your child learnt really, really well um, and you can't understand why they struggle at school so much, but actually you're right by their side, you're there their regulator, their trusted person, and in school you're not there, so automatically their uh, their anxieties are heightened. So perhaps you could give them something of yours to look after during the day, or perhaps that special key worker in school could give them something 
just so that they know that they're in mind, that you've not disappeared, that you're not leaving them and that you'll be back. It's also important to think about a team around your child. So the designated teacher in some schools will be the headmaster or the head, te or the head teacher rather. Um, they may not be available to your child all the time. In fact, it's likely that it will be somebody completely different that your child really gets on with. So it's important to have a team around your child and that it's important that your child knows who, who's in that team. So we might have a team Jake, for example. It might it will include the head teacher if they're the designated teacher. It may also include the secretary who says hello to them every morning. It will include their teacher and perhaps a one-to-one -one, um, member of support staff that's in the classroom. Or your child might really enjoy um, spending time with the PE teacher and it's important that they're on board as well. So, you, you know, we all like different sorts of people, don't we? So um, it's important, I think, that your child has a bit of um, bit of choice in who their team are or who belongs to that team, a bit of flexibility about who they want in it. Perhaps identifying a calm or safe place for your child um, will be a, a good thing to do. And again, schools can be quite, um, I guess they, they, they can tell you where the safe place is going to be, but that might not be where your child feels safest. So again, negotiate. If somebody can walk your child around the school and ask them where they feel safest, um, then that really needs to be the safe place. Um, it might be important that your your child checks in with somebody in the morning. So would be that be the caretaker or whoever's supported in the classroom. That key person they feel safest with in school is the person that they need to say good morning to and for that person to ask them how their evening was, what they're doing today, have they got everything that they need. And a checkout would be even better as well. So if they could do one thing, that would be good. If they could do two, that would be amazing. And any triggers that you, you recognise that your child struggles with, pass that on to school. It may be that um, they really struggle when it's very windy, for example. You know, they, they don't know how to regulate themselves. It might be that they find Christmas time difficult or the end of terms difficult. Just make school aware of that so that they can um, have a better opportunity to notice. Some of you might be familiar with the Secure Base model. And it's by Mary Beek and Gillian Schofield. Um, and, and it can be really helpful to think about this in school. So it, it sort of just focuses people. So when we're thinking about a secure base for a child, we need to think about who's going to be available for that child, who's going to help the child manage their feelings, who's going to build up the child's self-esteem, who's going to help that child feel effective, and also who's going to help that child feel like they belong. And although the model was set up for belonging to home, I think it's important to think about belonging to a school. So how does your child feel like they're an effective member of that school? And for older children, they may be being excluded or perhaps put in inclusion or taken out of the class for a bit of intervention. That's not helping them feel like they belong. So how can they build up that role for your child so that if that happens to them, then they're still welcomed back, they're still a really valued member of the school and that everybody in school wants to see them there. So this is just my interpretation of how we can think about that when we're thinking about the child and what the child's needs are and the child's emotional needs and their behaviour, so the whole child. We need to make sure that that child feels that they're part of the school community but still connected to their parents. And all of those people, that team around the child, need to provide verbal and non-verbal messages that they are connected to both and also feel that help them feel that they've got a sense of belonging so that they can be connected to school and a valuable member of the school but in the same way they need to feel connected to home 
and so that re- for that reason that relationship between home and school is really really important and again that then will reduce anxieties and help that child settle and learn better because we know that an anxious child or a child who's worried about something is not going to be in the right place for learning so until that child feels settled and not anxious cannot access the part of the brain the thinking part of the brain to um, to absorb any learning that's going on so it's key that we reduce anxiety and the secure base model is a way of perhaps doing that If your child has additional needs or, as they're known in school, special educational needs or SEN or SEND, then their needs will be looked at by somebody called the SENCO or the Special Educational Needs Coordinator or the SENDCO, which is basically the same but Special Educational Needs and Disabilities Coordinator. And this person may be different to the designated teacher. So you may have the designated teacher for previously looked after children involved and also the SENCO. So the SENCO is responsible for the Special Educational Needs Register and if your child's name is on that register then there will be a plan of some sort and this is different in, in each authority. So the SENCO will oversee the plan and the plan is there to make sure that all children will achieve their potential and be the best that they can be. If needed, um, after a while, if the plan has no impact or very little impact, then the SENCO can decide that perhaps something called an education, health and care plan may be of more use and better help meet the needs of your child. So if your child's been on the Special Educational Needs Register for a while and there has been lots and lots of interventions tried, a lot of planning, a lot of trialling, a lot of testing things out and a lot of reviewing and still people don't feel that um, your child is making the progress that would be expected given the interventions, school can complete something called the EHC1 which will then trigger um, information going forwards to see whether an education health and care plan might be helpful. Um, now an education health and care plan in most areas will carry funding with it so that um, there's some extra provision to try something different. In Leeds that's not the case and the funding comes from something called funding for inclusion so school will be able to tell you about that. Um, the HC1 can be completed by you as a parent this doesn't happen very often but obviously if you're doing that then it's really important that you keep the school informed because they're going to have to come up with evidence and so when it does go to the multi-agency panel if school haven't got the evidence then the assessment won't go forward to see whether an education health and care plan would be helpful. So at the panel that's consisted of um, a multitude of educationalists from different backgrounds so there might be a head teacher, there might be a special educational needs coordinator, um, an educational psychologist, perhaps somebody from speech and language. That there will be a richness to the decision that's made so that people can look at that from a multi-agency perspective. Um, if the decision is made to go forward and assess to see whether an education, health and care plan would be helpful, then a 20-week time scale kicks in and at that point um, you'll be asked to go to something, uh, an additional meeting that will then give the opportunity to discuss or have a richer discussion about what's needed, what it might look like and how best you feel your child's needs can be met. Um, it, from the multi-agency panel, um, they will write to lots of different professionals involved with your child to get all the evidence from all the professionals that are involved and then they will make a decision on whether to make a plan or not. Now if you need more information about that, um, every authority has a local offer. So if you just put www.yourlocalauthority and then local offer or Google local offer and whichever authority you're in, then it will come out and let you know all the information that you need to know for your local authority. 
In the same way, um, each local authority has to offer something called um, a Sendias service. Um, so that's special educational needs and disabilities information, advice and support service. Um, and that's an arm's length organisation that is there to offer guidance and advice and support should your child have any additional needs. And when we're thinking about schools, perhaps have a look at the school's behaviour policies and check these out before your children go there. Some schools have something called positive behaviour policies where there's a very strict um, regime that must be stuck to. So you might do something one day and that's one strike and you might get it wrong the next day and that's another strike and that will lead to something else. Other schools will be a bit more flexible, so perhaps ask about those sorts of things before your child starts at a school. And also ask about how they manage internal exclusions. Is your child going to be sat in a booth? You know, there's been a lot of um, information in the newspapers about this recently and what that might feel like and look like. So is it a school that's got booths? How would your child manage in that? Some do really well. Um, for others, it is just excruciatingly painful and very shaming. Um, so think about that and, and also ask about perhaps what isolation might look like. Um, some really impressive schools that I've worked with or been into recently have um, something called relationship policies rather than the behaviour policy. So I think that can sometimes be a bit of a reflection on how schools view behaviour and how um, strict they might be when kids are struggling. And for those children who really struggle um, and get excluded, it's important not to panic because I guess the whole reason for an exclusion is to regroup, think what can be different for that child when they go back. Um, you're allowed 45 days exclusion in total in, in an academic year and then a permanent exclusion will kick in. At which point, on day six, the local authority are responsible in providing any education. Um, if you've got a child who's on an education, health and care plan, then the expectation would be that that would be reviewed before there's any permanent exclusion. Exclusion should be official. Um, and that means with a letter stating why your child has been excluded, how long for, and also that your child will be provided with any appropriate work. Sometimes perhaps, um, and this depends on you as parents, I guess, uh, schools will want to unofficially exclude a child. So um, I've known it, for example, where can you come and collect your child? They need to calm down for the next three days. And that's a really tricky one because that's not recorded anywhere. So that isn't an official exclusion. However, your child is not in school. So it's not good practice at all for that to happen and I guess you would want to challenge that unless it's part of the plan that actually you know your child comes becomes completely dysregulated and needs to be with you um, and that's fine so long as there's a plan to work that up so that it reduces in the times that that child is sent sent home or has to be collected. If the child's excluded for longer than five days then on day six, it's up to the school to provide, provide full-time and appropriate education. Some schools will send children off-site to different schools, so you might want to ask about that, um, because a lot of our kids will really struggle with going to a different school or a different provision, um, and that, that might be more harmful than helpful. Um, but it, again, as I said, it is a chance for people to work out what needs to be done differently and to regroup. Schools might ask you um, for a managed move and what I would say there is tread carefully and think about what the impact is that that may have on your child. So a managed move, if a child's struggling in a particular school they might say well I think a managed move would be helpful. So that would then be up to the school to um, identify a different school for your child to go to. Um, that might be across the city, it might involve more transport, it might just happen between a Friday and a Monday. So think about all the preparation that you would want to do for your child attending a different school. Think about how it might feel if 
perhaps um, a child goes on a managed move to a different school that means they stay on the role of their current school but they see how it goes at the new school and the new school might say yep yeah, that's great they can come onto our role but the new school might also say do you know what this isn't working and you're, you you can't come here uh, and then in which case then they, they remain on the role of the first school that they were at so if schools do talk about that then perhaps think about it really carefully or give me a ring to discuss it and think it through I thought I'd put together some useful websites, so Adoption UK have got a helpful website, as have we actually at One Adoption West Yorkshire. Uh, the Beacon House is a fantastic website and is constantly updated, it's really really helpful. As is Anna Freud Centre, um, that I've not put down there, but if you Google Anna Freud it will come up. PAC UK have a great website as well and something called the Attachment Research Community. Um, gives gives lots of helpful information not just for ad, um, not just for parents but for schools as well and if you have got a child who may have uh, been exposed to alcohol in utero then nofazuk.org is a, an amazing source of um, support for adults for schools for teachers um, so go and have a look at those as well And at this point, if we weren't doing this virtually, I'd be asking you if anybody had got any questions. However, I can't do that. So um, the number's there if you want to give me a ring, 0113 or else you can email me, uh, Julie Pocklington, or sorry, julie.pocklington at leeds.gov.uk. And just because it's a Leeds address, please don't think that... If you've not got children in Leeds schools, you can't email me because you most certainly can. I hope you found it helpful. Um, and as I say, if, you, if it brings up any questions for you or if you want to talk about anything, then don't hesitate to get in touch. Thank you.